Uh, this morning before I get into the sermon, I, um, it is with a heavy heart that I share with all of you um, that our friend and co-worker John Harper, um, and many of you may know this, suffered a massive stroke on Friday. Um, we've received word from his family that the doctors have been clear with them that there's really no hope of recovery outside of um, a uh, supernatural act of God to heal his, his mind and his body. Um, if you know John, and he, he's here, him and his family attend here at the Mill Creek campus, um, you know that John lived his life to be with Jesus. Um, and that is, and outside of God doing something, that is where he will be soon. Um, and, and Karen has communicated and reiterated so many times how much John loves Jesus and how much peace she is drawing from that in all of this. And, and yet, in the midst of it, we know that there's tremendous grief and tremendous pain that they are experiencing. They have already communicated their appreciation for this church body who is surrounding them in, in prayer, who loves them and is journeying with them. In the midst of this, Pastor Jeff was able to drive up to, to Minnesota to be with Karen and to be with the family. Um, Drew, their oldest son, is back from Oregon and there and um, pray for Marcus, their youngest son, who is in the middle of, of boot camp right now um, and unable to, to be there. So um, continue to pray for the Harper family. Uh, staff and anyone, honestly, that would like to is gathering today at noon over in our South Street Campus Chapel um, just to pray for this family. You're invited to do that. We would love to have you um, be a part of their uh, be a part of that with us if you're able. So that's at, that's at noon today. Um, I know it's a little difficult to transition from sharing news like that into the sermon. Um, but if you know John, and I can hear him in my head right now saying, uh, suck it up and preach, Sterling. <laughs> um, and that's exactly, what he would, that's exactly what he would tell us. I uh, uh, read a book a few years ago now that I used oftentimes in, in student ministry um, by Andy Stanley entitled The Principle of the Path. And the premise of this book is, is looking at situations, and, and maybe you've experienced this, where you've found yourself in, in a place probably less than ideal, and you, you're asking yourself the question, how did I end up here? Like, how did, I, how did I find myself here? Maybe it's some sort of relational conflict, things are breaking down, or maybe it's some kind of financial strain in your life, or, or whatever it is, family crisis, whatever, whatever the situation is. Um, the point of Stanley's book is, is that our decisions, not our intentions, determine our destination. So he sort of goes in reverse sometimes, and you look at the situation, you ask yourself the question, well, how did I end up here? And he tracks it back through the decisions that we're making. He says, that's, that's exactly the place that your decisions were guiding you. And if you want to be somewhere different, you have to make choices that ultimately are most likely to land you in that place. And so his point is to sort of go back and say, okay, what's the source? Where, what are you drawing from? And, and this is very similar to what the case that James has been making throughout this letter to the early church. When we look at situations, we sort of have that, uh, we, we look at the event and we say, how did we get here? Or how do I fix this issue? Or what do we do now mentality? James wants to take us back beyond that and say, well, what, what is feeding that? What are we operating out of? He says, makes the point time and time again, that what we see on the outside is a reflection of an internal reality. So, for instance, James says in chapter 1, when, when we're facing trials and temptations in our lives, that, that how we respond to that should be a reflection of our understanding of who God is and the faith that we've placed in him. How we treat people, the, 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 the value that we place on people in a community like this as the church should, should reflect the fact that we understand that at the foot of the cross there is no hierarchy. There, there, there's no sort of um, platform where people are elevated or descend. We're all on level ground, according to James. In fact, our, our actions, our deeds it, as a whole should, should demonstrate or provide evidence of the transformation that has taken place 
inside of us because we've placed our faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. Our words as well, James says. These should flow from the wellspring of, of the hope and grace that we've experienced. So throughout this letter, James continues to address the issues that the church is facing by taking them back to the source, or what he identifies as ultimately should be the source, the the transforming faith in Jesus Christ. However, James says, and and we looked at this last week, really, there, there are two conflicting ways to look at the world, to operate, two, two types of wisdom, James says. He says there's the wisdom of this world, or what we would call false wisdom, and he says this is our default operating system. This is what we will draw from, what we will live out of, unless we've been transformed by the gospel and we're walking in step with the Spirit. But then he says if we're doing that, that's when we experience true wisdom or godly wisdom. False wisdom, James says, it's that, it's that all about me. So, so it seeks to advance what's best for me, claiming what's mine and, and, and making decisions to glorify my name. It's, a, it's about the here and now, but James says that this leads to disorder and, and every evil practice. True wisdom, however, in contrast, James says, originates with God. It's a way of viewing the world that that understands that God has a design for how we are to operate. And it's aligning ourselves with that. And and, and James says that this this wisdom produces things like purity and and being peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial and sincere. In fact, James says that this wisdom ultimately reaps a harvest of righteousness. See, so true wisdom, when we're living and operating in that, James says, that that ultimately produces the character of Jesus in us. So now James is going to address these issues that that appear to be present in the church, and, and he wants them to understand that they've reverted to operating out of a false wisdom. They've gone back to operating out of this default system. And James is going to show them a response that is, is restorative and it's only possible because of God's overwhelming grace. Let's turn to James chapter 4. I'm going to read this section, which is the first 12 verses, and we're going to really focus in on, on the first 10 verses together. Let's read this. James says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Do you desire, but you do not have, so you kill? You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask God, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he's caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? A couple things I I want us to look at here that James points out as we work through these, these verses together. The first is the conflict that we see with others, the conflict that we see with God, God's then response to us. And then what James says should be our response to God. Let's begin by looking at conflict with others. 
conflict with others. I, I am a little bit of a, of a history nerd, and so sometimes I enjoy watching the History Channel. And several years ago, they, um, they did a, a mini-series on the, the famous feud between the Hatfields and the McCoys. Um, it was actually really interesting. And I was kind of compelled by it because my, my grandma and her family lived in this eastern part of Kentucky, right on the border of, of West Virginia. And so they were very familiar with this whole family conflict and, and kind of had heard stories. So I was interested in, in knowing about it. This feud lasted decades. Um, over 13 people were, were murdered as a result of this ongoing conflict back and forth but what i did not know and seemed a bit astounding to me that the event that 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 appears to have started all of this was a dispute over who owned a pig in fact there was actually a a trial um uh randolph mccoy accused floyd hatfield of stealing his hog and and during the trial a man by the name of Bill Stanton, who was a McCoy on, the mother, on his mother's side of the family, but who had married a Hatfield, testified that the pig was, in fact, Floyd Hatfield. Um, Floyd Hatfield won the case. Bill Stanton was later shot to death by McCoys um, over a hog. And now this seems so extreme, right? It's like what we talked about last week when we were talking about the, the duel between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. It, it, it makes no sense to us. And yet, at the heart of it, there is something that, that, that resonates because we live in a world where conflict is unfolding around us all the time. So, and I would say even at times, many times, unreasonable conflict. And, and James is speaking into this, into the life of, of the church. Look again at verses 1 through 3. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you cannot have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So so James asked this rhetorical question, what causes these fights and quarrels among you? The NIV actually softens this for us. These, these are military terms. So James is really, he's saying, what, what causes these battles, these wars that's going on in the life of the church? And he answers his own question. Don't they come from the desires that battle within you? James, once again, goes back to the source. It's the result of these desires that, that are battling within us. So when we're operating out of the false wisdom of this world, when, when it's ultimately all about me, then I am going to fight in order to advance my pleasure. And this, this creates all sorts of ugly things in us. Things like those moments when we, we take delight in somebody else's failures or their pain. When, when we manipulate people behind the scenes in order to elevate ourselves. When, when, when we take action in order to make sure that, that we're getting ahead and we step on those people around us. And, and when we continue in that never-ending quest for more because our appetites are never satisfied. So these relationships... That, that are marked by a shared faith in Jesus begin to disintegrate into this spiral of conflict because I'm worshiping the God of me. And James is addressing this head on. And the God of me is never satisfied. It always seeks more. And this relational conflict that James describes here, it makes total sense. Harmony and, and unity can never exist for any serious amount of time when, when more than one person is present and is operating out of these desires that were, are within us, this desire to advance self. It's like, it's like putting two toddlers in a room and only one toy. It never ends well. And we experience that as adults. James even uses this example of praise. Is when, you, when you pray, when you pray you're not praying, uh, Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. You're, you're praying, Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name, my kingdom come. And so James says, God's not, he's not going to answer that prayer. 
And what James, what grieves him so much here is that this is taking place in the church. This covenant community where, where unity and love for each other are supposed to be so uniquely different that people are drawn to Jesus as a result. This doesn't mean that we as Christians never disagree. It, does, it doesn't mean that there can't be such a thing as legitimate conflict. Of course there can. But this isn't what James is addressing here. James is saying, look at all of this conflict that is present because people are operating out of self-centered desires. Trace it back to its source and you'll discover that it's born out of this false wisdom that you're operating under. And of course, James here, there's, there's a point of application as James is all about. It, 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 it allows us to pause for a moment to ask where we're experiencing relational conflict in our own lives. Specifically, where is there conflict between us and other Christians? Because it, there's a chance here for us to search our hearts. It's a, it's a checkpoint to see what it is in us that is contributing to that. It's a chance to look back and consider again our operating system that I am living out of. Because if it is this false wisdom that James has described in chapter 3, then relational conflict won't be far behind. But, but James here, he shows us that the conflict that we can experience in the context of community, this isn't, this isn't even the primary issue. Because he goes on now to describe conflict with God. Conflict with God. I, I am a bit of a uh, conflict avoider at times, sometimes to a fault. Um, I, I can be a, a little bit of an appeaser and a peacemaker, and so sometimes when there's people specifically like in family and there's things going on and you got to take a side and I don't want to take a side and I think everybody's right and and let's just all hug it out and all this sort of things but that's not always practical and once you get married right you always take a side and it's one side and I'm with mom and I'm with my wife and this is whatever is right yes I will do that like if you've ever seen the show everybody loves Raymond right there's, the, there's like the basic storyline of that show is that moment where his his wife and his mom, who lives across the street, have a disagreement, and the rest of the show is basically him hemming and hawing about what he's going to do, and it's funny, right? Here, James pictures something for us in, in our conflict, our relationship with God, and, and he's ultimately like, you have to understand, you've taken a side, James is saying. Look again, back in chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. This is what he says to the church. He says, you adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he's caused to dwell in us? See, James here is, is as he so often is, is, is very clear. Friendship with the world means enmity with God. In fact, he's, that word is, is hostility. I'm being hostile to God. So James does not paint a, a middle ground here. And he uses this language of relational covenant context, but he uses it in the negative, right? He says, you adulterous people, you, you, you promise breakers. You've been the recipients of God's covenant love. You've received his forgiveness. You've experienced his faithfulness. And now you're going to walk out on him. You're, you're going to revert back to that operating system of the world what james referred to last week in, in chapter three is earthly unspiritual and even demonic you're going to let that be the governing authority of your life church james is asking and james suggests a a conscious choice here that word friend that, that's used in verse four it, it loses some of its impact and in our culture, because we live in a social media world and we have Facebook friends and Twitter followers and Instagram likes and all of that, that sort of thing. But in the culture that James is writing into, that word created a degree of, of it meant a degree of proximity, of, of relational closeness and emotional intimacy that was only shared with the few. So these, these people were the people that were closest to you in your life. These were the people that you 
aligned yourself with. So James is saying, if you align yourself with the world, if this is the value system and the source of authority that you're going to adopt, then he's saying, I choose, you choose to be the enemy of God, to have hostility towards him. And in true James fashion, it, at face value, it feels so over the top. But, but James is speaking truth. He's not talking about reconcilable differences where we just sort of have a degree of, of difference in our opinions. He's saying that the system of this world is diametrically opposed to God. Verse 5 says that, that God's not okay with that. He, he's not satisfied with that, but rather he jealously longs for the spirit he caused to dwell in us. And hear me on this. It's, it's a good thing that God is jealous for our affections. It is a reflection of his love for us. If, if someone was competing for my wife's affections, and, and I was sort of like, well, you know, may the best man win kind of thing, like, that, would be a, that would be an indication that there was an issue in my love for her. See, God's, God's jealousy for our reflection, or our affections is, is born out of his love for us. It's, it's, God is jealous for the affections of the heart of the follower of Jesus because he knows that ultimately in him we find everything that we need. So James says when we align ourselves with the wisdom of the world, it's not, it's not only causing sort of relational conflict in our community, it's putting us squarely into conflict with God. And because God is a jealous God, he's not okay with that. And so he responds. This is God's response to us. God's response to us. Look at verse 6. This is one of the best verses in the Bible, by the way. I don't know if that's theologically correct, but just from an emotional sense. Look at what he says here. But he gives us more grace. But he gives us more grace. Imagine for a moment that someone that you have positioned yourself in hostility towards, that you've positioned yourself in as an enemy of, what would you anticipate their response to you to be? At best, we could hope for um, just ignoring us. More likely, it would be revenge or retribution. But this isn't what James describes here. In fact, Jesus tells a story. In Luke chapter 15, he tells the story of this son that, that has left his father and, and, and taken his inheritance, and he goes out and, and he lives and he squanders it all. And he finds himself in, in deep desperation. And in that moment, he says, well, look, even, even my dad's paid hired hands have it better than I do. And so I'm going to go back and, and I'm going to say, look, I'm not worthy to be your son. I understand that. But would you hire me on and let me live with your servants? And so he goes back and, and Jesus tells the story of the father who, who is awaiting the return of his son. And as he's awaiting the return of, of his son, he sees them in the distance. And he's so overwhelmed with joy that, that he runs to meet him on the street. And it's not a place of correction or retribution. It's not, it's, it's restorative. And, and the father places this robe around him and he puts a ring on his finger and he says, come back and live as my son in my house again. See, this is what James is describing to us here. He's describing the God who, who is abundantly, um, his, his abundance of grace is beyond our imagination. He's describing the God who even in the midst of our rebellion, even when I have positioned myself in hostility towards him, responds to me and says, I have grace for that. I've got, I've got grace that covers that. This is the beauty of who God is and the beauty of, of this message is that it's for you. This is for me. I've had many conversations over the years where I've, People have told me, that all sounds great, but you have no idea what I've done, or you don't have any idea how far my rebellion has gone, and so I have, I'm, out, I'm outside the reach of God's grace. And hear me, there's no such thing. 
You, you can't out sin God's grace because he has more grace. Whatever that is, whatever it is in your heart, in your life, James says he has more grace. This is response to me. When I've made myself his enemy by choosing to live with the God of self at the center of my heart, he says, I've got grace for that. Grace covers that. So in light of that, then what James shows us, what should be our response to God? Our response to God, James chapter 4, these last few verses. He says, but he gives us more grace. That's why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. See, James, is, his, his message to the church, his heart for us, is, is receive it. Accept it. We don't, we don't like that idea of, of submission. That, that communicates to us weakness. We don't like the idea of surrendering, but think about what you're surrendering to. James is saying surrender to the best thing that could ever happen to you. So surrender to a God who, who loves you so incredibly much that he would send his son in order to pay the punishment that I owe. Like surrender to that, James says. Submit to that. There, there's two parts of this that James lays out for us. One is, is a rejection, right? It's, it's, it's grieve and mourn and wail. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. Confess and saying, like, I've been operating this way. I, I, I'm going to identify that. I'm going to expose that. I'm going to call it for what it is. And then submit yourselves to God. Come near to him and experience the incredible blessing of his nearness to you. His presence with you. See, James here is, is, is begging the church. He's pleading with the church to, to allow them to, to submit ourselves once again to the good and gracious God, to, to his rule in our lives. James is pleading with his readers once again to allow themselves to live under the rule of grace because he knows that it's in that place that the church experiences everything that they need. It's a call to repentance, a call to submission, but it's a call that is sent out by grace. To come, surrender to me, the God who loves you more than you will ever know. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you that on a morning that is difficult, and that our hearts are grieving um, a friend who in, and a family who are suffering this morning. That you are present with us and that your presence with us is marked by your grace to us. So God, this morning, I, I confess, I acknowledge, I identify where I have lived out of the God of self. And God, this morning, I want to surrender to your rule and reign of grace in my life, and may that be true for us as the church. May we be marked by that. Lord, do this here so we can carry this message to the world around us. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning, and I'll offer the benediction. As always, um, once again, our prayer team is available. If, if, if we can pray grace over you, please um, allow that to, uh, to be a privilege of ours. We invite you to come. Now receive this morning's benediction. Go now in the name of Jesus Christ, the God who gives more grace than we could ever ask or imagine. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.